once upon a time. I have some books. I have many. Um, but these books, two of these books, were on the table last time I did a film. And somebody said, aren't you going to tell us about the books that are on the table? Um, and coincidentally today, yes I am. But I'm going to start with another one, which is my favourite. This one. Perfumery Practice and Principles, which I fortunately bought before they all sold out and the price has gone bananas. But uh, Kalkin and Jelinek's book. Um, and I'm going to read a story from this because I'd like to talk about perfume bases. And sometimes when I say I, that I use a base, the question comes back, you mean a base note? And the answer is no, really don't mean a base note at all. Once upon a time I was in a, a perfume shop talking to the owner and somebody came in and she started listening and she said, oh you make perfume? And I said, yes. And she said, what bases do you use? Quite aggressive. I said, I don't use any. And she went, ah. Oh. And I still wonder sometimes, who was that woman and why was she so interested? Because at the time I was not using any bases because I hadn't discovered what they were. So I'm going to tell you what they are, but, or rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out what um, Kalk and Jelinek say they are, because they are genius. It says, once upon a time, okay, chapter 10, the use of bases. Bases may be thought of as the prefabricated building blocks of perfumery. They may be as simple as an accord between three or four materials, or nearly as complicated as a complete perfume. A base should have a well-defined character since it is an essential structural element of the perfume's composition. Perfumers vary widely in the extent to which they use bases in the creation of their perfumes. Some regard the making of bases as one of the most important aspects of their creative work. They embody in their bases the most original ideas building them into the otherwise classical structure of their perfume to provide much of its, ex, its, ex, its essential character. Michel E. used to tell his students that it could take him a year to make a good base, but once complete, he could use it to make a perfume in a week, and sometimes who would do it in less. Other perfumers prefer to work on perfumes with open formulas, using bases only to give special effects such as a green or a fruity note. Many modern perfumes would appear to be constructed in this way, with most of the formula made up of simple materials. Many of the earliest bases, some of which are still widely used, date from the early part of this century, that is to say, last century, because this book is from the 1900s, not the 20s when raw material supply houses were less involved than they are today in the formulation of finished fragrances. Often, the new synthetic materials produced by such companies would first become available to perfumers, working independently or employed by the fashion houses, wrapped up in the form of speciality bases. In this way, the exclusivity of such materials was preserved, while providing perfumers with a whole new palette of olfactory notes with which to work. Specialities such as the Parman theme base, based on Nonna Dayton. Nonna, hmm, bollocks. <laughs> Not based on bollocks. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of it. Nonna Dianal. It's based on Nonna Dianal, the Parma theme based. Well, maybe it's gone out of business. Uh, Florizio, based on Alile Ionone and Mousse de Saxe, based on isobutyl quinoline, all date from this period. This practice still continues today, not so much to hide the identity of the captive material, which can usually be revealed by analysis, but as a means of selling the material in a way that can be more readily incorporated into a formula. So, among the more recent introductions are Vertralis, based on Vertral, Cassis 281, based on Bucoxime, and Dorinia, based on Beta Damasco. Now, it continues, but I think we still need to talk about what they are. So, I have some. 
and I used some and I'm going to just pick up this book which is uh, Jean-Claude Elena's Perfume, The Alchemy of Scent written when he was perfumer at Hermes and this book is sort of famous because it includes his list of 200 materials that he uses and this came out and the rest of the perfume world went oh, no what about the other no. 2,800 that we use, um, what, what, what's going to happen? We're all going to go broke. But um, I thought I'd mention that two of those that are in the list, one is Cassis Base 345B, Tada, which smells of not so much of black currants, more of Ribena or Crème de Cassis de Dijon. Um, it's more jammy than the actual um, Cassie's blackcurrant bud, which I have here as well. Um, and it also is an indication here of how much I can afford to buy at any one time. This is my backup bottle of Cassie's base. This is all I have of the blackcurrant bud absolute. And another one he has in here is uh, Neroli Artessens. So he doesn't list that he used Neroli. He uses a Neroli base instead. So what are these things? These are creations which have been made by really, really, really good perfumers. Um, a lot of them come from Ferminesh and Givaudan and Simrise and you know, the big guys, um, IFF. And they don't exactly replace the naturals. Sometimes they smell even better than the naturals. But I have, what, what have I got here for example? I have got Sandalwood 77125D, which is made by Feminish. And this smells just like sandalwood. And it is cheaper than sandalwood. And it doesn't involve cutting down um, very old, lovely trees which are endangered. So sometimes I use this. And the important thing about a base, so it's not a base note, it is, it is, you can almost imagine it as the sandalwood made by people instead of the sandalwood made by trees. It's pretty much as complex and it smells as gorgeous. And when you put it into your fragrance, it smell, still smells like sandalwood. That's the point of it. I could make you know, some kind of a sandalwood accord, maybe out of sandalwoody bits and pieces, and when I put it in my fragrance, it might disappear and smell like something different. These things have been tried and tested and developed over years and years. And some of them, like it says here, some of the originals are still in use because they are so good. They smell so like the original that they, they hold together. Now, Dorinia is one of the ones mentioned. It's a rose base. And when I first met our friend Harry Sherwood, um, he saw that I had some Dorinia in the lab and he said, it was the first question he ever asked me was, hmm, you got Dorinia, don't you think that's cheating? And I was slightly taken aback by that, but my response was, well, do you think that using Rose Absolute is cheating? Because Dorinia smells like roses and Rose Absolute smells a bit like roses, slightly less. And so Harry thought, hmm, think about it. Because what Harry likes to do as... Um, Kalkin mentioned, is take the original individual materials as building blocks and make his own lovely bases. Perhaps it's just because I'm three times older than Harry. Okay, two and a bit. But if somebody's already gone to the trouble of doing it for me, then I will use Rose Jivko a lot of the time. So I've got my Rose Absolute here because I love it. But I also have a lot of Rojivko and some Dorinia as well because I like those just as much in a different way you know like two different relatives so um, the Rojivko it smells actually it smells more like a rose that's still alive whereas Rose Absolute in the process of extracting all of those, you know, the aroma materials from what, a million flowers or something, a ton of flowers to get a kilo. 
So there you go, a quarter of a tonne's worth. Oh no, that's actually half a tonne's worth, about half a kilo there. It you loses some of it to naturalness in the process. It's not really natural for half a million flowers to leap into a distillery, is it, and get themselves extracted. So, this is just, roses of course smells like roses. It smells more like roses than rose absolute, in my humble opinion. Um, here you go. Mm. <laughs> That's the good noise. That's the noise to make when... It smells really nice. It does. Um, it, it smells amazing like roses, but the marvellous thing about it is that you put it into your composition and it still smells like roses. No, as does the natural. I'm just being... Oh, yeah, I just want a tiny, tiny... It's an eighth of a tonne of roses there on the tip of your smelling strip. Mm -hmm. A lot of rose. I've probably should I mention price? Yes. Um, rose Chifco, if you try and buy one kilo by yourself, it will cost you 660 euros, which is quite a lot of money. But if you want to buy a kilo of this, it's 3,000. So um, that's rose absolute because you know, rule one, I already did, always put the lid back on. Rule two, write everything down. This is this is very different. See, it's like rose coloured. Mmm. <laughs> it's you you if you didn't know, you wouldn't necessarily know that was rose. No, I don't recognise that smell. And I have had people smell that and think, one, somebody once said, Oh, is it tar? I know this it's tar. And somebody else in this room, like, oh, it's cucumber. I'm like, no. I genuinely wouldn't know what that was if you just gave it to me blind. Hmm. So you take your rose, absolutely have to do some work with it in order to make the fragrance smell like rose. I mean, it's really nice, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. But the Jivko smells like roses. Yeah. So, um, would I make my own rose base? Yes, I would, and I have. But is it as good as the one that Givaudan makes? Not in a million years, I don't think. I haven't got a million years, because I'm quite old. So that's, <laughs> that's one of the reasons that I use them. And sometimes I will use some Rose Absolute and support it with Rose Yvko. Another thing that happens is that when perfume companies will make these beautiful uh, bases, quite often they will, they'll kind of dial down the allergens in them and dial up the other things which are unrestricted so that you get to use more of them in your fragrance. So there are many reasons. I have um, Jasmine Sandbag here. Lovely. That's also gone up to about 3,000 a kilo. I've got the uh, San Paquito Chivco and I've got uh, uh, Nactis Jasmine 818801. This is more like Jasmine, um, play, uh, the usual Jasmine uh, Absolute, not the Sandbag. But, um, yeah, this one can smell just from the lid. You don't even have to take it off. It wafts. And this actually smells a lot like the flower. Because when you make Jasmine Absolute, it smells much more like the flower than Rose Absolute smells like roses. I smell a cup of me. So... Mm. <clears throat> it's very jasminey. So I'm considering, I'm considering which jasmine. I've never owned a jasmine um, a recreation of jasmine base before. I've always used jasmine. But if you are learning to make perfume and you find that rose absolute and jasmine absolute are just so expensive, and you're practicing and you want to get good at making perfume you can really readily substitute the bases for them. So definitely go with some sandalwood base instead of sandalwood while you're getting the hang of it. And then if you want to swap them out and use the 100% naturals, by all means, blow the budget. But um, also, you know, rule three, get to know your materials first because with jasmine, the jasmine recreations smell really, really like the jasmine absolute. With rose, the rose recreations smell like the flower, 
but they don't smell exactly like Rose Absolute. So you would have to compare. I've got some others which are, I've got the Narcisse Base 184092D from Ferminiche. And that smells just like Narcissus flowers. The ones which smell, some of them don't have an aroma, but the ones which do, they smell like spring. This smells like spring, whereas Narcissus Absolute, and this is enough to buy a nice second-hand car, you know. Um, this, <laughs> this is expensive, but I got this to make uh, clouds. And Narcissus Absolute smells like a kind of green leather, like like you've planted a garden in leather compost. It's it's really quite dark and dirty, and it, it, I think you'd be quite hard pressed to identify that this was a flower from the absolute. So this is more like rose. Well, don't put it down. That was never smell it. Smell it. Smell it. <laughs> Take the lid off. Like that. Like that. <laughs> You can't describe it like can't describe and then the flowers in leather compost and, and then, then put it then down. Put it away again. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so first of all, write it down. Put, see, I put the lid back on already. So um, somebody did point out after the last film that writing everything down and always put the lid back on. It's not just a rule for perfumery; it is a rule for life, which is true. I'm not going to, even going to dip this, I'm going to leave the <coughs> lid on, mm -hmm. but it's got the, the inner lid in and I'm going to let you just uh -huh. sniff it lightly from there. Wow. Not too much. Because... Mmm. They're really interesting. I mean, the naturals are yeah. very, very interesting. The, the, uh, the bases are, we're going to give you exactly what these things should smell like. Yeah. The naturals go off in all kinds of interesting directions, but you wouldn't necessarily know that that was... Again, I wouldn't have a clue what that mm -hmm. was. Yeah, or the, yeah and the, the, the sandalwood, before you came up, I had a, I had a whiff of it. And um, yeah. it is lovely, and it smells more like sandalwood than a lot of other sandalwood it's, that it's, I've smelt. It's really amazing. I mean, when I smelt it, so I didn't know I needed it until I smelt it. Mm. That's the trouble with some of these. Um, oh, okay, here's a good one for you. Can I ask a really stupid question? Please. What's the difference between a, a, a bass and an accord, then? Well, it's a very good question, actually. And uh, since um, my favourite book doesn't even quite explain it, a, a bass is an accord. Ah. But it's a, it's a very, very good one which is designed to smell specifically like a thing. Right. Um, <laughs> should I? No, I no. won't warn you. <laughs> <laughs> that is... It, you were working with this the other day? Yes. It is, it is the civet. Well done. Yes. <laughs> that is absolutely it is. gross. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh. yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, mean, I know. Okay, so that is the civet synth, which I've got. That is um, synthetic civet, also from... Is it from Ferminish? I think it's... I'm pretty sure it's from Ferminish. Um, what's it from Bad Sarah. Uh, but yes, so that is... Oh. I mean, it smells just like the real thing, and it is cruelty-free. So... Wonderful, that's a good reason. I mean, if you want to put civet in your fragrances, you like old style down and dirty fragrances, which, yes, we do, uh, then it, civet synth is great because it means that you can have this base that smells like civet and you don't have to stick sticks into any poor little animals, um, which is always a good thing. So, yeah, um, so a base note is in perfumery, something which lasts a very, very, very long time. A base is something which has been made out of, it, out of the component parts to smell like a thing. Usually, either because that thing is um, endangered, sandalwood, rosewood, or cruelty, civet, um, you can get oud bases, or just because it's cheaper. 
All because these things can actually be made to smell more like the original plant than the extract from the plant smells like the original plant. I mean, tuberose. Harry's made an absolutely gorgeous tuberose base and it smells like the flower and the flower is beautiful. I've got tuberose base here called tuberose, which is just French for tuberose. It's French for tuberous as well. But um, because it's a lumpy flower, that's what it's named after. It's not a rose. And my tuberose base smells like tuberose absolute. So this time the base has been made to smell like the extract from the flower, which is quite leathery and dark and doesn't smell like the flower at all. So I have that. Uh, yeah, so the cassis base, that's one of the ones which Jean-Claude Allen has is in his 200 things I cannot live without. This one, cassis base 345B. And this smells a lot more like blackcurrant jam or jelly or ribena than actually the currants from the bush. Um, and the, the blackcurrant bud absolute, which I also love, uh, is made from the buds so it's kind of leafy and green and it does smell fruity but it also has certain cat pee sort of uh, tinge to it. Um, so if I'm making a blackcurrant fragrance which is you know mostly every day that's what I would like to do every day really is make blackcurrant fragrances I would use both. Well, um, I'd like to mention Queer de Russie which is in that book as well so that's it's just a French for Russian leather so I have here the Nectis Cuir de Russie 601660, just in case they made a different one. Uh, lots of people make Russian leather bases. I do tend to make my own leather accord. I'm not sure if I'd call it, call it a base yet, but I have that. I, and I make mine from Isoputal quinoline, patchouli, and uh, white birch, which is... Uh, the way that there's the materials that uh, leather smells used to be made from as soon as isobutyl quinoline was invented. So, but this Creole Russie one, it's probably... Yeah, this, it oh, smells like leather. It's like, it smells like tanned leather. Okay. Also, so we're not breaking the rules here. There, there is a bong in the end of that. There is, there is. I'm not... Yeah. Not sniffing directly out Not there. sniffing directly out of the bottle. Thank you, Arthur, for... That reminder, I'm not really taking the order. Mm -hmm. Just you know, the, the amount really of aroma nice. that it escapes even when the bung's in the pot. Cute. Um, so, would you use these bases? Well, I do. Jean Claude Ellen does, it's good enough for Jean Claude, it's good enough for us. Okay. Um, there is a thing, I was just going to, this is another book, which is really useful. It, um, Perfumes of Yesterday by David Williams. And there are a lot of kind of ancient useful formulas in here. Some things, there are some materials in which we don't use anymore because they've been restricted or banned. But I thought I would read out what's in, it's on page 290 if you have this book. It's on page 290 if you don't, but it's on page 290. Um, and it's the Gillyflower um, formula, A formula for Gillyflower. Giroflé. Um, this one, for the night scented stock, what would a perfumer use to make a fragrance of night scented stock? So we have here extract of violets. Well, nobody uses that anymore, so you'd have to use your ionone alpha and ionone beta. So here we go. Nice ancient perfume recipe. Oil of bergamot, lovely. Oil of narrowly bigarade. Otto of rose, Bulgarian. Oil of rue, we don't use that anymore, instant skin reaction, but... And then we get on to the lovely traditional amyl salicylate and terpineol. Then we move into extract of jasmine, extract of jonquil, that's narcissus. Extract of rose, oil of verbena, oil of langlang. Hyacinth, synthetic, jasmine, synthetic, narcissus, synthetic. So... Oh, well, maybe jonquil isn't a daffodil. I'll have to look it up. What's a jonquil? Answer below. Um, but so, what we're saying here is in this ancient formula, they were using 
a hyacinth base, a jasmine base and a narcissus base which I made earlier and it doesn't give the recipe for those. Plus anise aldehyde and heliotropin, infusion of styrax, tincture of civet, coumarin, muscambre and vanillin. That's what was used to make this particular formula. So bases have been around for a very, very long time. Um, a bit more from my friend. Well, I wish it's my friend. It's not my friend yet. My literary friend. Um, and there's a bit about what Jean Carl used to do in here. Here we go. Um, yeah, so Jean Carl actually used to make a lot of his own bases, which then like, lived in their perfumery, and all his students could make, use them as well. Um, and Jean Carl is that, you know, the master of balancing, the one who created the method where you balance everything really carefully and then don't waste any. Um, so, some more story. The availability of new synthetic materials during the first decade of the century, it's the last one, also provided the inspiration for the creative, creation of bases that attempted to duplicate the fragrance of flowers, many of which were already used in perfumery. One of the first was to, to be imitated in this way was lilac, based on a combination of terpineol, heliotropin and cinnamic alcohol. Benzyl acetate, amyl cinnamic aldehyde and indole were used as a basis of jasmine. The ionones made possible the recreation of violet. Hydroxycitronella formed the starting point for muguet, while eugenol, cinnamic alcohol, vanillin and benzyl salicylate formed the basis for the duplication of carnation. The use of such floral bases and their more modern descendants still forms an indispensable part of the perfumer's technique in the building of perfume creations. Compounding notes for many types of floral base have already been given in Chapter 6. They have, yes, although it doesn't give you quantities, it just gives you a list of what you can use because you've got to put the work in. More recently, the great advance that has been made in chemical analysis and the synthesis of complex organic molecules has made possible a much closer approximation to the actual composition and odour of natural flower products, as demoed. Even so, few of these reconstituted naturals, invaluable though they are, can provide a full replacement for the genuine product. They may best be thought of as specialised bases resulting from a collaboration between the chemist and creative perfumer. I think since the book was written and now, they've got better. These bases have got even better. When's my edition from? 1994. It's a great book, but that is... No, it's 2021 as we speak. Um, men, many, many, not men, many of the important perfumery accords first discovered during the first half of the century were also embodied in some of the famous bases created at that time. A number of these are still available and widely used. The Ambrane and Melis bases, which we shall be discussing in connection with anyway, later. That's he will, not us necessarily. So built around the combination of paracresyl derivatives, phenyl acetates, and cedar wood. Oh, sorry, that's the animalic bases, not the ambrenas. Animalic bases, paracresyl der derivatives, phenyl acetates, and cedar wood. Yeah. Some of the most successful bases contain quite simple accords of only two or three materials. Here you go, Arthur, answer to your question. Perhaps dressed up with a number of auxiliary products. The combination of phenoxyethyl isobutyrate and dimethyl benzyl carbonyl acetate, used in many fruity notes, produces an unmistakable character that survives even when used in trace amounts in a finished perfume. Similarly, an ambergris base, made from a simple combination of labdanum, olibanum and vanilla, brings an unmistakable effect. 
Such bases, which the perfumer may create for him or herself, are not only valuable building blocks in the creation of a perfume, but are a convenient way of introducing trace amounts of materials that in combination make a special contribution to the character of the final composition. Now, the bit about Jean Carl. Another technique much used in the past, though less popular today, was to take well-known products such as methyl ionone, vetiveryl acetate, or hydroxycitronellal, materials that themselves could often form 10 to 20% of a finished perfume, and decorate them with a number of other synthetic and natural materials to form a base with much of the complexity and roundness of a finished perfume. Many such bases, for, for example, alphenol and selvone, used in Magriff, were created by Karl to be used not only by himself but also by client perfumers who lacked perhaps the same level of technical proficiency. Because pretty much no one ever had the same level of technical proficiency as Jean Carl. Hmm, maybe Jean Carl Dior. Edmund Vinitsko. Okay, but Karl was up there at the top. One of the most valuable uses of bases to today is as a means of introducing into a perfume intensely powerful materials that in isolation can give an unacceptably harsh effect. Many green notes fall into this category, but by combining them into a carefully worked accord, they can in fact bring a naturalness to a perfume, and one that is also very difficult to duplicate. Fruit bases are another example of this technique. Combinations of powerful fruity materials, often using products such as phenoxyethyl isobutyrate or hexyl cinnamic aldehyde as a carrier, combine to give an effect unobtainable by formulating with single materials. Trace amounts of fruit bases are some of the most widely used in perfumery today. So what we're talking about is making your own accords which contain a small amount of a particularly intense material and surrounding that and making something that smells pleasant so that the amount of that particular material that you want in is ameliorated. It's there's less of it so it doesn't take over your whole composition. So we're talking here about making accords because, you know, a base, a base is an accord which keeps its original character when you mix it with something else. You can make lots of different accords, but if it still hangs together, it holds up, it's still identifiable when you put it in the rest of the fragrance, you can count it as a base. Some do, some don't. But we're talking about... Um, making your own accords, which you could call bases if you're particularly proud of them and if they hold up. Make those containing something. What are the things that take over? Oh, cardamom. I've made myself a cardamom accord so that it still smells like cardamom when I put it in, but it, you get a little bit of cardamom and it doesn't take over the entire construction. You might I mean, for example, with the civet base even, you might want to make an accord including the civet base because that still has the potential to take over the entire planet. So, you know, it's complicated, but a base is an accord that holds up. A base note is something that lasts a long time. Is that, was that enough? Was yeah. That enough? Is, that, yeah uh, uh, is there anything I've said that was that was not um, clear, do you think? Uh, Have I confused you? No, no, I think it all makes perfect sense. I mean, I'll bleep out when you said bollocks. You will? I bet you <laughs> won't, will you? <laughs> well, uh, great. Yeah, just because I, I, yes, found two things I've never heard of and I should have read this, but what? Um, mm -hmm. Can we throw the civet strip in the bin now? Yeah, sorry. Okay. You still got it? I'm yeah. Sorry. yeah, yeah. I can't smell it from it. It doesn't, it doesn't travel too far. <laughs> there we yeah, go. It is something else, isn't it? Um, yes. Hmm. I just did the last sentence. Mm -hmm. Paragraph. 
because it's, it's it was, this is such a lovely book. It's just, I mean, everything about it is great. Um, perfumery style today, 94, demanding a greater initial impact based on a simpler type of formulation has reduced the use of the type of base that represents a high proportion of the finished composition. But floral bases and those that bring a strong positive character to a perfume are still widely used and the knowledge of them is an important part of a perfumer's training. Now you see, so what he's talking about there is in 1994 we're getting, we're having the beginning of that time when it's four big building blocks like the Grossman Accord or, the, or even just Isoe Super taking up 80% of the fragrance and then a few simple materials on the top. Then he's talking about open open formulas. And I think with the rise of niche and indie perfumery, there is definitely room to bring back use of bases. I think they're coming back in because we're going for more complexity. There was a lot of simplicity brought in in the late 90s, uh, 20, 20s, 20s, 2010s, 20s, zeros, noughties when commercial perfumery, mass market perfumery got how fast can we make it and how simple can we make it and what's arisen since well over the last 10-15 years is the desire to bring complexity back into it. People spending more time over putting their formulas together and budgets no longer being squashed into smithereens. So I tend to compose apparently in a style that was popular from about 1920 through to the early 80s. So I'm happy with these things. But make your own, but on the other hand bear in mind that probably greater <laughs> minds than ours have made these for us and I like welcoming, welcoming them in. Yeah. That'll do. Well, I don't think that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Ha, <laughs>